Good afternoon. Hi. All right. My name is Nicholas Carey. I'm the president and co-founder of a firm called Blockchain, which frequently gets confused with the core innovation that many people uh, will be learning about today and hopefully over the coming years. Um, it has been a long journey for me, and uh, the last 12 months I've probably flown about four or 500,000 miles speaking with policymakers, speaking with consultants and uh, people that run central banks to talk to them about this incredibly important innovation. So let's get started. A little trip down memory lane. Uh, I absolutely love photography, and a lot of the pictures you'll see in this presentation were taken during my travels over the past couple years. I used to have to develop pictures, and um, now, with my iPhone, I can take a photograph and broadcast it to all my friends and family anywhere in the world instantly, and it doesn't cost me much. And we know what happened to Kodak. I used to have to go to Blockbuster to rent the VHS or the DVD I used to love and drive down in my car and hope that they had it in their inventory. But now I can stream any content I need to on any device instantly nearly for free. And we also kind of know what happened to Blockbuster. Because of my travels, sometimes I forget important dates, like my mother's birthday, and uh, hell hath no fury like a French mother. So uh, fortunately, I have a calendar reminder now, and I'm able to get in touch with her by email and send her a thoughtful uh, message once a year. So the point is, the digital world is part of our DNA now. It's part of how we share our experiences, how we keep in touch with our loved ones, and how we consume our entertainment. So the real question that I'm trying to pose is, why can't money be digital too? And it's probably best not to have our heads stuck in the sand on this issue. So, where are we today? This is Wall Street in 1957. And this is Wall Street today, in full color. It's a $13 trillion industry that has not been fundamentally transformed by technology. A lot of the ways things were happening a few years ago are the same. It fundamentally doesn't have an imagination for how things could be better. So what is it really there for? Well, it facilitates transactions, and a transaction network needs three things to function. It needs to have a currency, it needs to have settlement with a high degree of certainty, and it also needs to have a ledger to keep track of who owns what. So banks have built centralized ledgers for a very long time. It's basically a database of accounts, and they keep it all in one place. This should make transactions relatively simple, but in 2016, it's faster for me to FedEx this podium from Helsinki to New York than it is for me to make an economic transaction there. That's crazy, right? It should be a simple task, but it's not. Banks have centralized all this control and all of these systems, which increases risks, risks and makes them nearly impossible to interoperate. Well, I'm frequently asked, what is the blockchain? Well, besides sharing the name of my firm, a blockchain is basically a distributed database. The best way to think of it is a ledger that's all over the world, but instead of being in one place, it's actually in the cloud. So I like to explain it this way. It's a spreadsheet in the cloud. And if you take away one thing, here's the important bit. That ledger is globally replicated and distributed all over the world. And when an update happens in one place, it's happening in all those places simultaneously. This is an incredibly important development in computer science, and it's going to fundamentally change the way the internet functions and the way we interact and transact with each other. So let me provide a few concrete examples right now. For those of you that have never seen this work before, I encourage you to go download a blockchain wallet right now. You can go to the iOS store or uh, Android, it'll take you 30 seconds, and with 10,000 lines of open source software code, you can replace your bank. You can be your own bank. So just like if I wanted to sign up for an email address somewhere, I go to a vendor and I put in my name and my email address, and I can sign up, and then I can share that with anybody else in the world and start to send messages to them. Well, digital currencies work in a fairly similar way. I have a public address that I can give to anybody, and then I can start making transactions with them. So I would share my address with someone, and then they can make a payment to me. That transaction then gets broadcasted to that big spreadsheet in the cloud. This is a live transaction feed from the Bitcoin blockchain. Oh, I'm going to go back to that because it's important. So every single day, there are hundreds of thousands of transactions going through this network. And it's supposed to run, but maybe not today. Um, so we'll keep going. That 
feed is processing transactions 24-7, 365 days a year. It doesn't know what a bank holiday is. It's a computer network, and it runs without error, and it's been running without error for nearly seven and a half years. A feat no back-end banking system can claim. So where are we today? Well, the Bitcoin blockchain is performing roughly 250,000 transactions a day. This isn't that much, but a lot of capacity building has been engineered over the past 12 months. As a risk asset, Bitcoin has been particularly interesting in the past 12 months. We've seen incredible volatility in markets like Venezuela, Brazil, Greece, Ukraine, and many others. In fact, against the Great British Pound, this currency has performed over 168%. In times of global volatility, this asset class is overperforming. And um, at Blockchain, we just added our 10th millionth user this week. We're adding about 180,000 of them every single week, and we're experiencing the best quarter of our firm's history. And that's no coincidence. This is needed now, and here's a good reason why. There are billions of people in the world that don't have access to financial services. Four billion people don't have credit cards. Millennials do not expect to have a bank account in five years. Why would they? They can download an app on their phone instantly and start to participate in a global economy. And it doesn't matter what color your skin is, where you were born, what your credit score looks like, what gender you are. This thing is completely agnostic to all those things. It's a technology, and it's going to revolutionize the way we transact. So beyond payments, which is just the very first application of this technology, there are many other things we can do with it. Once you have a database that's an immutable record-keeping system, a big spreadsheet that nobody can change, but everyone can write to, what you have is a lot more than a spreadsheet. You have a global property rights system. And the first thing we've been testing on it is money, but it's not the most important one. You can track other things on this database. In fact, there's a company right now that's writing diamonds so that we can track the provenance of goods as they move from market to market. But it's not just diamonds. It could be artwork or keys to your car or a title to other things like land or stocks and bonds. And there are many companies attacking this at this moment. Supply chains have huge problems because we cannot know that the things we're necessarily putting in our bodies or putting in our homes have come from the places that we think they do. So a good example of this is the tuna industry. There are all kinds of global treaties around how much fish can be brought to market and whether or not it's harvested in uh, the correct ways and the correct yields and all those kind of things. Well, by using a database system that's immutable, you can actually track those things as they move to market and ensure that the temperature of the goods came in at the right time and people aren't fussing with them along the way. So bringing incredible amounts of transparency to places that need it desperately. Payment rails are an obvious one, but the example of the podium I gave is just one. It's so stupid today that when I go try and buy a coffee in downtown Helsinki, I have to pay at least 10 pounds to process a credit card transaction because it's so uneconomical for the vendor to accept money. That's because the network isn't efficient. We need to find a way to bring billions of devices online so that they can transact with each other. So imagine if every single smartphone was able to do that. Is that really that far-fetched? I don't think so. A store of value is a pretty compelling use case for digital assets like Bitcoin and other ones. And um, I'll give a couple examples, but we saw that earlier this year, we've seen incredible devaluations in currencies around the world, and people can hedge against that risk, just a little bit maybe, to guard against the destruction of their wealth and sovereignty of savings. So I'm pretty interested in the store of value as a use case of digital assets. But maybe the most interesting one is smart contracts. So if money is digital, then you can program your money to do all kinds of neat things for you. So 10 years ago, the iPhone hadn't been invented yet. So let that sink in, and let's remind ourselves the progress that we've made. What will the world look like 10 years from now? Well, there are many people at this conference talking about AR and VR and autonomous vehicles and many more things like the Internet of Things. Well, let's take and gaze into the future just for a moment. Imagine a world where you're at home and uh, you leave in the morning and your refrigerator detects that you drank all the beer in it last night and so you're really low, which is a problem because you've got buddies coming over after work tonight. No worries. Your uh, refrigerator is going to order up some new beer. It's going to get it from Amazon Prime. A drone that's sitting on the rooftop of your neighbor's house that's using... Um, 
It's getting uh, new uh, power from the rooftop there. It's going to fly off to the delivery center, pick up the beer. It's going to come back to your uh, house. It's going to drop it off. A geolocational trigger will set. It'll make a payment to you, to Amazon, to the drone company, and the guy's rooftop who provided the solar panels for the charging instantly. I don't think that's that crazy. We can get there. And I need that drone delivery service for beer like yesterday. So someone in here should go build that. Um, smart contracts are much more compelling than just that silly example. But in the future, all of our devices are going to start to talk to each other. And uh, that's already happening. We need an economic system that can perform these transactions at incredible scale, nearly free for everyone to participate on, an open and fair and accessible financial future built on software. And I think we can get there. So, so what? Why is everybody talking about this? Well, this is the world's first immutable record keeping system. The asset classes can be scarce, it's borderless, it's frictionless, and anyone can participate. And it's the only transaction network that has zero counterparty risk. So I know that's a lot to get into, and uh, I'm hopeful to have conversations with people today, so you'll find me around the conference. Let's remember that not that long ago, people didn't understand what the internet was. And uh, this is a famous talk show host in the United States, 1996 or 94, I think. He says, what is internet anyway? And uh, I think we can all agree that if you didn't at least have an internet strategy forming in the late 1990s, um, you were probably on the wrong side of that curve. I think maybe the question people should be posing themselves today is, what is their blockchain strategy? So um, I've got a little video to share with you guys today, uh, hopefully to kind of coalesce and crystallize uh, the concepts I've been sharing with you. And, um, Last couple thoughts on the firm. We are growing like crazy. So we're based in London. We have offices in New York and uh, Luxembourg as well. If any of the things I told you today sounded interesting, come visit us. We're hiring people. We need to build this uh, platform for everybody, and I need your help. The digital world is a part of our DNA now. It's how we share our experiences, how we consume our entertainment, how we stay in touch with our loved ones. This is how we used to send letters, to travel, to make phone calls and shoot movies. Mankind invented software and technologies, breaking every distance, border, difficulty, and pulling the world instantly closer together. But what about banking? Think about it. Billions of people in the world have no access to financial tools. Borders and the system create barriers. We trusted banks, but they collapsed time and time again. They take hundreds of billions in fees from us. Bitcoin doesn't care where you're born, what color your skin is, or where you are in the world. It's an open network. It's maintained equally by people all over the world. Anyone can verify the transactions, and it happens instantly. For just a few cents, you can send any amount of money to anywhere in the world. Bitcoin is a global community of inclusion, an invitation to participate in an open world. Join us today, start a Bitcoin wallet, and help us shape the future. Thank you very much for your time today.